Since I'm sadistic and horrible, I thought I'd start with this. The Diagram from Hell. The bad news is, all of this is fair game, and you would not be wrong to try to memorize it all. But the good news is, we can work through this so that it's less about memorizing the whole shenanigans, and more about keeping it simple and internalizing a few patterns. I'll point out the most important nuggets along the way so you learn the high yield stuff before trying to cram every last bit of trivia into your brains. First thing you gotta know, what basic molecule makes all steroids possible? The answer is cholesterol, the precursor molecule to every one of these bad boys. Its conversion to pregnenolone is the rate limiting step, the one that's controlled by ACTH. Once ACTH allows entry into the steroid synthesis pathway, the magic can begin. Quick, what are the three layers of the adrenal cortex in order from outside to inside? Go! Okay, time's up. You should really know this one. The three layers, the glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis, synthesize different steroids, and it's all dependent on a set of what I call the gateway enzymes. Let me show you what I mean. The glomerulosa layer has all the right enzymes to synthesize aldosterone, but it lacks the 17-alpha hydroxylase required to synthesize cortisol. The fasciculata layer's hydroxylase works fast enough to route steroid production pretty much exclusively to cholesterol, but it lacks the 1720 lyase that the reticularis layer uses to synthesize DHEA, androstenedione, dione, and to some extent testosterone. FYI, the main steroids synthesized in the zona reticularis are DHEA and androstenedione. dione. Testosterone, which is a much more potent androgen, is really in the minority. Here's the bare minimum of what you need to know. 1. Cholesterol is converted from pregnenolone to progesterone, and both pregnenolone and progesterone need to be 17-alpha hydroxylated in order to enter the cortisol pathway. 2. To get closer to the end products aldosterone and cortisol, the first two enzymes are the same, and yes, you do need to know their names. The first is 21-hydroxylase, the second is 11-beta-hydroxylase. The alpha and beta aren't really so important, but the numbers very much are. 3. The pathways towards aldosterone and cortisol synthesis have a bunch of intermediates that all sound like cortico-something. But here's the weird thing. They all have mineralocorticoid and not glucocorticoid activity. I'll say it again. If it sounds like the word cortisol, but isn't, be it corticosterone or 11-cortico-whatever, it does not act like cortisol. It acts like a weak aldosterone. Finally, and this is an old point, while ACTH may control entry into the steroid synthesis pathway, Angiotensin II is required for the final step of aldosterone synthesis. Thus, it's controlled independently from the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Got all that? I get you. Even the bare minimum seems like a lot, but we'll work through a clinical example together, and I think it'll make a whole lot more sense then. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the main way in which you'll be tested on steroidogenesis. It involves a partial deficiency in one of the steps used to synthesize cortisol. And since cortisol is the main hormone that feedback suppresses CRH and ACTH, low cortisol is going to cause a significant bump in ACTH. This not only routes more cholesterol into the steroid synthesis pathway, increased ACTH also causes a global proliferation in all cells of the adrenal cortex in a misguided attempt to get them to crank out more steroids. Like I said, the cortisol deficiency is only partial and isn't usually a big deal. But depending on the enzyme that gets knocked out, there can be clinically significant derangements of either the mineralocorticoids or the androgens. So first off, let's recap what they do, starting with aldosterone. What's its effect on blood pressure? What about potassium? Aldosterone increases blood pressure by causing salt and fluid retention, but sacrifices potassium for sodium via the sodium-potassium pump. What about androgens? Alright, this is an easier one. In a fetus, they cause the development of male external genitalia. In adolescence, they cause the development of male secondary sexual characteristics. So take one last look at this diagram and let's try to work this out from memory. Think you can handle it? I hope so, because we are going! First up, what would you phenotypically expect from the most common form of CAH? 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Pause the video for a moment and think back to the diagram. Can you remember which pathways are inhibited? A 21-hydroxylase deficiency shuts down synthesis of mineralocorticoids and cortisol, leaving behind only the sex steroid pathway. 
And because the stupid pituitary assumes that if there's not enough cortisol, the whole adrenal gland needs to kick in the pants, that means there's going to be a serious excess of adrenal androgens. So how do the parameters listed in the table below change? Aldosterone, like we said, is responsible for increasing blood pressure but sacrificing potassium. But since the mineralocorticoid pathway is shut down, we'd expect to see the opposite decreased blood pressure and increased potassium. We'd expect the increased androgens to cause increased development of the male external organs, but what we actually see is actually a lot more noticeable in females. The excess androgens give the developing lady parts mixed signals, causing a range of virilized phenotypes, ranging from clitoromegaly to vaginal underdevelopment, you actually don't usually see any sexual side effects in infant boys, though they often undergo precocious puberty. As it turns out, though, genital ambiguity in infancy may actually be a good thing. It at least warns you that there's a problem going on. With girls, you notice the weird genitals and say, oh my god, something's wrong, and usually the problem gets taken care of. What sometimes happens to boys is that they get sent home because everything looks okay on the outside. Meanwhile, their aldosterone deficiency causes them to dehydrate like crazy, and the next time they're brought in, it's to the ICU, because babies can't tell you they're thirsty. In fact, the only clinical sign that's routinely present is severe vomiting. So, here's a summary of what goes on in 21-hydroxylase deficiency. Now pause the video and see if you can do the same for an 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency. So the first step is to figure out what pathways are closed off. Remember important pathway number two, the first two enzymes that divert the progesterones down the aldo and cortisol pathways are 21-hydroxylase and 11-beta-hydroxylase. So an 11-beta-hydroxylase simply shuts down the production of aldo and cortisol just one step later. Sounds like it causes the same problems, right? Wrong! The virilizing effects on girls are similar because the sex steroid pathway is still the only one that goes completely untouched. But harken back to important fact number three. Once you go down the aldocortisol pathways past progesterone, you have a whole bunch of cortico-sounding intermediates that all have weak mineralocorticoid activity, no matter which side of the pathway they're on. And 11-beta, unlike 21-hydroxylase, is downstream of the first cortico-intermediates. But Arjun, you ask, aren't they just weak mineralocorticoids? Verily they are, says I, but remember, with a lack of cortisol, the pituitary has literally no idea that the adrenals are doing anything at all, and sends ACTH to make the adrenals work double time. That double time production of even a weak mineralocorticoid is usually enough to cause mineralocorticoid excess, meaning that the blood pressure will be increased and potassium will be decreased, as you can see in the table below. There's one more important form of CAH that I'm going to have you do on your own, this time in the form of a flash quiz. How would you expect the following to change in 17-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency? Mineralocorticoid activity and androgen activity. These are essentially the same parameters as before, just like we did earlier. Pause the video and attempt to work this out step by step. Since 17-alpha is the gateway hormone that allows synthesis of the glucocorticoids and is thus also required for the synthesis of sex steroids, both cortisol and sex steroids will be diminished, and you'll have a lot of aldosterone. We're not even talking about that wimpy 11 cortico stuff. This is the real deal. As a result, blood pressure is going to skyrocket, potassium will drop, and it'll actually be the boys that end up with the ambiguous genitals because testosterone is required to properly develop the male genitals. Girls only experience the sexual effects of 17-alpha deficiency at puberty because they may not be able to synthesize the requisite estrogen to develop secondary sex characteristics. Hopefully this all makes a little more sense now. It's a little tough to remember all of steroidogenesis, but I think working through examples makes it more memorable. So, I think I successfully made the case that sex steroids are pretty essential to normal development. And it doesn't take a genius to realize that they're pretty important in maintaining certain functions in adults as well. Difficult as it may be, can you think of any times that sex steroids are pretty unhelpful? Or even downright harmful? To answer this question, remember that sex steroids, like many steroids, are responsible for the growth and development of certain tissues. Take breast tissue, for example. Now, there's nothing wrong with the growth of breast tissue under normal circumstances, but the problem arises when certain breast cancers happen to be estrogen responsive as well. The same also goes for ovaries, so we employ certain drugs to prevent inappropriate cell growth. The aromatase inhibitors, anastrozole and eczemestane, prevent the synthesis of estrogens from their androgen precursors. 
Estrogens can also be blocked on the receptor end with receptor blockers like tamoxifen and raloxifene. So what's the male equivalent? I'll give you a hint. Unlike breasts, this one is invisible from the surface. Bad prostate growth comes in a couple of different flavors, benign prostatic hypertrophy being the lesser of two evils. Since prostate growth is mostly dependent on the more powerful androgen, DHT, the 5-alpha reductase blocker, finasteride, can help this issue by inhibiting 5-alpha reductase, shutting down production of DHT. Unfortunately, remember the weaker androgens, testosterone and androstenedione, do have some effect on prostate growth. So if you've got the really bad prostate news, namely prostate cancer, you're going to want to block all three of them with an androgen receptor blocker, like flutamide. You'll learn about this more in Repro, but for now we're going to try a test yourself question on for size. The rules of the game are, Arjun puts up a question on the page, and you have a minute and a half to answer the question. Then, we'll go over not only what the right answer is, but also how to break apart questions like these and come to the correct conclusions. Everybody ready? Alright, let's go! A 16-year-old girl comes to the physician concerned that she has not yet begun menstruating. Her blood pressure is 160 over 100 millimeters mercury. Physical exam reveals anatomically normal female genitals, but lack of any secondary sexual development, including breast buds or pubic hair. In this patient, hormones from which layer of the adrenal gland showed in the image above are overproduced? Zone 1, Zone 2, Zone 3, Zone 4, or Zone 5? Five seconds. Pause if you need more time. All right, that wraps it up. Let's break this question down. So, this may just be my emergency medicine approach to things, but what's the very first thing you want to read when presented with a multi-step, step one vignette like this? If you said, the first line, duh, that's actually incorrect. In fact, it's the last line you want to prioritize because that's where the question is. So the question asks us, which adrenal cells are overproducing hormones? And knowing that the questions about an adrenal problem gives you a huge advantage. I mean, if you started with the first line, a 16-year-old girl with primary amenorrhea, that's actually a humongous differential. Um, it involves both endo and repro, and while that's kind of what you have to work with in a clinical setting, this is step one, and you've got to answer these questions as efficiently as possible. So, what kinds of adrenal problems might cause amenorrhea? Remember that the adrenal cortex produces aldosterone, cortisol, and sex steroids, while the adrenal medulla produces catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Of all of those, only the underproduction of sex steroids could give the patient the presentation that we see in the vignette. Remember that an overproduction of adrenal androgens would lead to virilization, and our patient has normal female genitalia. Increased cortisol could lead to menstrual irregularity, but it definitely doesn't lead to a complete lack of all secondary sex characteristics. But that doesn't answer our question of which hormone is overproduced. If you got tripped up making a careless mistake here, then definitely make sure to read the last line carefully before the vignette. If you did read the last line, then at this point, the notion of one hormone being increased and the sex steroids being decreased should at least lead you to think about congenital adrenal hyperplasia. At this point, if you know all three of the common CAH as well, you'd be able to say right off the bat that the only one that shuts down the production of sex steroids is 17-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency, which causes increased aldosterone. But if you're a little rusty on your hyperplasias, it's a little tougher because in theory, increased aldosterone, cortisol, or catecholamines could increase the blood pressure. But look at it this way. First of all, congenital adrenal hyperplasias always involve decreased cortisol. That's the whole reason that the gland in experiences hyperplasia in the first place. And catecholamines, which aren't even affected by CAH, by the way, typically also cause other pretty recognizable symptoms like sweating, palpitations, and anxiety, not just increased blood pressure. So you're left with aldosterone either way you look at it. So the final step, you have to interpret this adrenal slide. Don't complain, by the way. I, I warned you about this in endocrine anatomy. First of all, you have to find out which side is the cortex and which is the medulla. Now, in this picture, the medulla is pretty easy to spot because it's more basophilic and also more porous because of all the vessels inside of it. The capsule is kind of cut off in this picture, but it's pretty safe to say if 5 is the medulla, then 1 has got to be the capsule. From there, you can figure out that 2 has got to be the glomerulosa, 3 is the fasciculata, and four 
is the reticularis. And which one of those produces the mineralic corticoids like aldosterone? Remember, the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. So salt has got to be the outside layer, the glomerulosa, closest to the capsule, which is answer choice B. Oh, and for those of you who are wondering, yes, the adrenal gland mostly produces weak androgens. But even though a woman's secondary sex characteristics generally arise as a result of estrogens, estrogens are created from the aromatization of androgens. So no androgen production means no estrogen production.